Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's Q&A session and for submitting so many great questions in advance. My name is Jennifer Crosby with Stark Systems and I will serve as your moderator. A couple of housekeeping items before we begin. Today's, pre today's presentation is being recorded and will be sent in a follow-up email. If you have any questions, please submit them via the question and answer feature on your webinar toolbar. Let's get started. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Janet Haas, CEO and Principal Consulting Epidemiologist with Innovative Infection Prevention, and Leon Young, Network Infection Prevention Manager, Facilities and Construction with Allegheny Health Network. On that note, let's dive into the Q&A. Janet, the first couple questions are for you. Kimberly and Ron asked, when does ICRA 2.0 go into effect and are we required to use it? So ICRA 2.0 is a voluntary um, tool that's meant to be used at your discretion. Um, if you have something that's already working for you, you need to take a look at what's in ICRA 2.0 and see where you need to add things and what makes sense for your facility. It's definitely meant to be used as a tool and to be modified to meet your needs. It's not required to use that. Um, but having said that, I think that whatever you decide to do, you should have a rationale for the decisions that you're making and the policies that you're putting in place. And do you have any thoughts on when these will be widely adopted? So I think that it's going to take a little time. First of all, people are tuning in to webinars like this and getting themselves familiarized with the changes. And some people may not even know there are changes yet. What with COVID and everything else that's been going on, I think people's uh, attention has been a little distracted at times. But um, you know, it'll take it'll probably take a couple of years before people really get through this and make it a part of their policies, procedures, and, and what they're doing in their facilities. Leon, can you highlight the differences between ICRA 2.0 and the original ICRA? Thank you, Jennifer, yes. Uh, in a nutshell, aside from the obvious language changes, additional detail listed in the different activity types and the patient risk groups, and the addition of a class five ICRA, the main difference in my opinion is that ICRA 2.0 is getting infection prevention more involved and getting their hands dirty. Uh, in respect for our time here today, I'll only point out two of the two of the biggest and most important examples I see. Uh, number one, um, verifying HEPA filtration, and number two, a more detailed ICRA permit that requires the active dictation of specific controls and specifications that will be required by infection prevention. Teal asks, what about the pre-construction risk assessment? Janet, do we still do this or is this now rolled into the ICRA? So that's a great question and I think there's some confusion around that. So the pre-construction risk assessment uh, is no longer being done in its original format, but it's been rolled into something called the safety risk assessment, which is really a program assessment uh, for what the goals are and what the needs are of the facility. So I can give a couple of um, examples that a safety risk assessment might include um, things about what kinds of services are gonna be offered. Are you gonna do something that would require you to have um, a larger number of disability uh, safe bathrooms? Um, what kinds of equipment are gonna be used? Where are you gonna store that equipment? Of course, that has implications for infection control, but also for fire safety, making sure that you have enough um, outlets, all that stuff that is programmatic uh, became part of the safety risk assessment. And that's for infection control, where you're gonna do have storage, where do the sinks fall within the rooms, uh, how much storage is there, et cetera. That's part of the safety risk assessment. And then the ICRA is really focused on the actual construction and keeping it safe for that construction period. Great. We have a question from Cheryl about the order of assessment. Leon, how can we assess the construction before thinking about the areas around the construction site? 
I love this question because I believe this is in regards to the fact that the uh, table four surrounding area assessment comes after you pick your class of precautions, whether it's one through five in the ICR 2.0 document. Um, the answer I have for that is don't think of the surrounding area assessment as coming after the class of precautions. Um, when you do these types of things, you want to evaluate your surrounding area assessment at the same time you're determining your ICAR class. Janet, what about the actual policy and forms? Shalom asks, do you have the required negative <laughs> pressure values written on these documents? So I think that um, like many things we're going to talk about today, it's up to what's in your policy. So the pro of putting the exact requirements in the policy is that it's right there for people to see and respond to and it's on the forms and so on. Uh, the con on that is that sometimes you can't meet the exact requirement and if it's in your policy, then you really must meet what's in your, uh, in your policy every time. So it gives you a little more wiggle room if you don't have these things listed or if you um, word it in such a way that you say that's the, that's the goal, um, but you may not be able to meet that level in some situations sometimes. Leon, are anterooms required for class four work and do they require a separate HEPA filter? Thank you, Jen. Yes, the anteroom is required for the class four work. Uh, it is dictated in the ICR 2.0 document under class four. Um, there is nothing in ICR 2.0 that says the anteroom uh, requires a separate HEPA filtered air machine. However, a HEPA air machine may be needed in the anteroom in order to create the cascade, cascading airflow that the ICR 2.0 speaks of. Um, I believe we have a, I believe Jen has a slide. I see it so now. You, thank yep. you. Slide so yes, just as I was as I was speaking a second ago, um, with the HEPA air machine in the anteroom, uh, it's not required. And the picture on the left is your entrance into the construction site. And then the picture on the right is as you walk into the anteroom. So this is, a, this is an example of an anteroom that has a HEPA air machine that is exhausting into your construction site and then the construction site is taking that air out again. Um, and your picture below there with the anteroom construction site and the cascading airflow, that depicts how the cascading airflow can be set up. Um, now you may not need to have a HEPA air machine inside the anteroom if you have enough negative air inside the construction space. I haven't seen that very often. Uh, in most cases, you do need a small machine in the uh, anteroom that is exhausting into the, into the construction site in order to create that cascading cascading airflow that ICRA 2.0 is asking for. Thank you, Jennifer. Another question for you, Leon. Zach asked if institutions take the document and modify it to meet their needs. For example, removing the part with boot covers. Yes, an institution can modify the document to meet their individual needs. Uh, years ago, as a matter of fact, I modified the ICR 1.0 matrix to include specific patient populations in the patient risk group table. Uh, I believe I put in there, um, I, actually I, I did a lot, of, a lot of additions, but I put in uh, skilled nursing facilities, assisted living facilities, and put those into a uh, patient risk group. Um, so the ICR 2.0 permit, uh, well, the, the new ICR 2.0 permit um, actually allows you to write in the controls that you will require for a specific project. And if you see that you see the picture there on your screen, that is the, the bottom half of the new ICRA 2.0 permit. Um, and like I'm saying, it, um, it allows you to write in the controls you will, you will require or maybe controls that you will not require, you will leave them off. So if you decide to leave boot covers out, you don't think it's necessary, then you don't write that in the, the first column there. But if you do think it's necessary, or if there's something else you want to see the contractor do, then you dictate specifically um, the controls and the specifications you want. And this touches on the previous answer I had about this is getting infection prevention more involved and it's getting their hands dirty. What about monitoring the pressure and dust containment? Janet, how often should infection control be doing this and how long should the documentation be maintained? So here's another one that um, I'll just speak out for the infection preventionists who, who may be listening in. This is a, one of our responsibilities to keep tabs on construction, but we are not the primary people that have to be 
responsible for checking this every single day. So the project manager or somebody else is designated as the safety person and would be monitoring on a shift by shift basis or daily basis. Um, and that documentation should be available for the infection preventionist to see. And the infection preventionist should be including this on her or his rounds and getting around to these places depending on where it is, what the sensitivity of the um, area is and the scope of the work that's being done. But um, we're not the primary people to be doing this. And, and for how long you should keep the records and where you should keep the records, that's really dictated by your facility's record retention policy and um, some of which is you know, determined by different states. So I'd check with um, your medical records people or your legal people to see how long they want all these kinds of records retained. Great. Lisa asked for some guidance on pressure reading. Leon, what are the options for monitoring negative pressure and what types of equipment is used? Thank you, Jen. This is another excellent question as this gives me the opportunity to highlight the edits that ASHI has recently made to ICR 2.0. Um, if you are not familiar, or uh, if this is unknown to you, the um, ASHI actually made some edits to the RICR 2.0 document, and this will, um, this question will describe those those edits. So, the original written, written document uh, from ASHI stated uh, quotations: magnahelic manometer or digital monitoring required, ball in the wall or visual monitors not permitted. End quote. Um, the recent edits have since removed that statement and replaced it with quote install device on exterior of work containment to continually monitor negative pressurization. To assure proper pressure is continuously maintained, it is recommended that the device have a visual pressure indicator, end quote. So let me take a second here and highlight the words continuously and visual that were used there. Visual to me means any type of pressure monitor, including the ball in the wall. And the word continuously means that any mechanical pressure device can be used because any one of them will monitor continuously um, as opposed to a single point in time test like a tissue test or a smoke test and the picture there will show you some examples of uh, visual uh, and continuous monitoring um, these are all visual again as opposed to just doing a, a single point in time smoke test or you know a tissue test you know opening the door just to just uh a tiny bit a jar and holding a tissue there to make sure you're you're you're, you're uh, developing negative pressure these are your visual and continuous monitors um, magnahelic digital digital manometer and also the ball on the wall great these next couple questions are also for you leon uh carrie asks do you have some general guidance for taking and interpret interpreting particulate guidelines cultures are different to interpret interpret but are there situations where you recommend doing air cultures for fungi, mold, et cetera? Thank you, Jen. And yes, cultures are difficult to interpret. Uh, taking and interpreting particulate counts with a handheld particle counter, uh, that takes practice and experience. Uh, elaborating on those details would have to be discussed outside of uh, time we have allotted here for this Q&A session, unfortunately, because that, be that can be a long discussion. Uh, now, using a particle counter, to verify that your HEPA machine is working the way it should be is rather simple. And that is something that I'm sure everybody here uh, on this call has seen in the ICR 2.0 document uh, that the, um, the ICR classes four and five are asking to uh, verify your HEPA machine and verify your, your HEPA filtration is working with your 99.97% reduction. Uh, there's, a note, there's a slide that will illustrate that task. And for verifying HEPA filtration for your class four and five, it's a very simple procedure as opposed to using a particle calendar for other, uh, for other, um, for other jobs or, or for other purposes. Uh, the picture on the left is a particle calendar that is resting on top of a HEPA machine, which is inside the construction site. And that's the intake where the particle calendar is. So that's taking a reading right there of the number of particles inside your construction space that the HEPA machine is pulling in. And then the picture on the right is a particle counter, the same particle counter um, on the outside of the construction site in your uh, patient care space, testing the particles coming out of that HEPA exhaust. You calculate that percent reduction with those two readings. 
Um, so you take your particle count at the intake, you subtract your particle count at the exhaust, with it, which is the picture on the right, which is always and should, should always be a lot lower than your particle, particle count at the intake. You divide that by the particle count at the intake times 100, and you get your percent reduction. Uh, easy way, way to remember that is your large minus uh, your small number divided again by your large number times 100. That gives you your, your uh, percent reduction. And then to address the second question about when to perform air cultures for mold, that is something that, is, that always seems to be up for debate. Uh, two particular instances when taking fungal air samples will have some benefit are, number one, when you are investigating a, a patient case or multiple patient cases, and number two, following abatement of mold, and you are looking for clearance cultures to make sure the abatement was successful. And most uh, abatement contractors will actually use the non-viable spore trap uh, spore trap tests. Great. We've received a number of questions about how to handle exhausting construction air when there's no window. Leon, is it okay to exhaust into the return air or just leave the HEPA filter running in the construction area in these situations? It is not okay to exhaust construction air into the return air. Uh, actually, from the ICR 2.0 matrix, uh, quote, exhaust into shared or recirculating HVAC systems or other shared exhaust systems, e.g. bathroom exhaust, is not acceptable, end quote. You should always make every possible attempt to create negative air. Uh, not exhausting, also known as scrubbing the air, is acceptable in certain situations and most definitely depends on the surrounding patient population and the type of work or the type of construction activity that is ongoing. So can I just say something? I think this is um, functionally maybe a big change for some facilities because uh, when they can't find a window, if they're in some interior space, um, finding a, an exhaust uh, duct or the HVAC system is uh, often a way that people have done this in the past. So this, this will be a big change for some facilities that are used to doing it that way. That's correct. Janet, are there different standards for outpatient areas? These areas are typically closed overnight and on weekends. Do facilities yeah. need to implement all these precautions in outpatient settings? So there are no different requirements for outpatient settings. You know, the, the ICRA 2.0 matrix is what the matrix is, regardless of the situation, you know, the, the setting that you're in. However, if you can take advantage of times when your, your um, outpatient area is shut, and there is an other activity going on in, you know, in areas nearby, you can sometimes do um, get, a, get away with without causing a problem um, and increasing risk for patients with doing some of this work at night um, and, uh, and on weekends. So it's, it's often a nice way to be able to do that. Um, you still have to be sure that equipment that's in the area is either moved out or if it can't be moved out, it has to be covered in some way um, to prevent that from getting dust filled. And, um, and a good assessment of the cleaning that's been done has to be done before you reopen um, for patients. So, you know, it is legitimate to try and take advantage of the time when patients aren't there to do this work, but you still have to make sure that the dust is maintained in the, in the work area and that the cleanup is done well. And one of the risks of doing it this way is that there's not so much supervision on nights and weekends. Um, so you really have to make sure that any of that equipment, any of the, the stuff that might be in the way um, is managed before the work begins on the off shifts. And what about in inpatient settings where the whole unit will be shut down for construction? So that's a little bit different because you're still within that acute care setting. And um, although the whole unit is shut down, it's uh, next to some other inpatient unit or um, some function that's going on within an acute care setting that's likely to be operating 24 seven or at least most of the time. And in addition to that, you know, you have to also be mindful of how are the staff, personnel, equipment, 
supplies, materials, and debris going to move to and from that unit that um, that's under construction, even though the whole unit is closed, there's all this other opportunity to be interacting with the areas of the of the hospital that are still open, seeing patients, and have uh, high risk people nearby. So it's really important to do these ICRA and the walkthrough and see can you get rid of the debris with a chute to directly outside? Can you know? Do you have a dedicated place where the personnel can come in and they don't have to walk through the whole hospital and so on? But uh, but you really have to treat this. It's usually a big job if you're shutting the whole unit down, um, and and that has implications for the area around it. Leon, what precautions are required when the construction is happening outside of the hospital or in another building on the hospital campus? Thank you, John. Another excellent question. Um, I have been involved in several uh, outside demolition projects or uh, excavation projects or combination of both. Um, outside of directly outside of a, a, a existing hospital, uh, operating operating hospital. Um, so I have a lot of experience with this. This topic is not addressed uh, with the ICRA 2.0, and in most cases requires a completely different look at ICRA. Uh, and I learned a, a a lot of valuable lessons uh, with these type types of uh, projects. Uh, learned learn some learned some lessons from the first time that I was able able to implement uh, the second time for the for for a, a, a second demolition. So essentially, your attention needs to be directed on precautions to keep outside demolition or excavation dust from entering your building, and that can be done in several different ways. But again, it, it's it's a completely backwards and different look at ICRA. Um, your public entrances, whether they are revolving doors. Uh, or your, you know, your your horizontal opening, uh, automatic opening doors, uh, whatever the case may be, those are your entry points, um, and those are the entry points that dust could get into your facility, and you don't want that to happen, obviously. So you can take a look at your at your pressure relationships inside the hospital, right inside those doors, and adjust if if you need to to put to to make it as positive pressure, so that your air is being pumped out of the building. So that it's it's so that it's essentially keeping dust out of the building as opposed to a negative pressurized building. Also, air curtains can help with that. Another um, another uh, look at it, or something else to look at when you're doing outside excavation or demolition, are your your egress exits. <clears throat> a lot of hospitals will have um, egress exit doors. It's usually a single door. You need to be vigilant and take a look at those doors and see how close they are to the excavation or how close they are to a demolition site because those egress doors are usually emergency egress doors. Uh, they usually sign for you know emergency uh, access only, whatever the case may be. But I have seen uh, I've seen these types of doors that were signed for the, for for those particular uh, um, uses, emergency exit only, but. Lo and behold, they were actually being used by staff to go in and out of the building, to catch shuttles, to leave the facility, whatever they were using it for, uh, multiple different reasons. And that was eye-opening, and that was a lesson learned um, from the first demolition to the second demolition that those doors had to be closed off, essentially. Uh, but keeping in mind your, your 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 life safety, that is an emergency egress. We had to do some different things uh, just to make sure those doors were not being used routinely. Um, and that and that helps to keep dust out of your building. Great. What about regular daily maintenance jobs, such as routine painting, installing door hardware, hanging pictures? Janet, do you see do these routine projects require an ICRA? So the ICRA 2.0 has the Type A inspection and non-invasive activities, and Type B small-scale, short duration with minimal dust and debris. Uh, classifications and these don't require um, an individual assessment or walkthrough. So you can have sort of standing orders, if you will, for some of these kind of um, above the ceiling inspection and uh, and other routine maintenance activities. It's a good idea to um, to make sure that the safety people and infection control may know about them if you can. I mean. It's, it's a tough one because infection control, at least I don't want to know every time somebody changes a light bulb, but the danger is that if you find something in some of this um, routine maintenance that then requires more work, um, sometimes the, the folks doing that work 
don't realize that they need to stop and then get a more formal assessment if, it, if they found something that requires a, a more intensive intervention. Um, so you can have these standing orders in your forms and your policy and procedures, and people can uh, either you know, fax that to the safety person or infection control or both or whatever. You have to decide what, what you want to know about and, and make sure that the people doing the work know what those standing requirements are for, um, for containing dust and debris. Leon, do you recommend testing the filters in AHU during construction or when they're replaced? I believe this question relates to performing particle counting in the AHU or air handling unit to confirm that the filters are working properly. Um, E.g., are the filters performing adequately based on their, their MERV rating? Um, this should be, if this is going to be done, um, I don't necessarily recommend it, uh, but if it's going to be done, it should be done during construction. Uh, while the AHU filters are being used and while they're aging. Uh, and additionally, um, your AHU vendor um, should be able to perform this task for you if needed. Janet, how often do you need to document uh, particulate counts during the, during the duration of the project? So I think this is gonna be according to your facility's policy. And there may be, there will be some projects that you are not going to be doing particular counting for. For example, if you're putting up a picture, changing a light bulb, doing these um, small scale uh, projects. But for the bigger ones, you you will have to put that in your policy or say that you're going to defer to the ICRA, you know, walkthrough, and it will be um, project specific depending on. Um, the scope of the work and the location of the work and so on. So each facility has to decide that. And are walk-off mats allowed inside anti-rooms, Janet? Yeah, so walk-off mats are definitely um, a key element to keeping dust in the construction site and not outside of the construction site. And the downside to the walk-off mats if they're outside of the anti-room or outside of the construction is they can be a trip hazard for um, people walking through your hallways. So the better place for them is actually in the anteroom as you're getting ready to leave that anteroom space. And Cheryl asked a couple questions about portable containment units. Uh, should these be separate dedicated units for the OR right, to I keep them cleaner? Or, uh, <laughs> and how do these get taken down without raising dust? Okay, so I think that, um, Portable containment um, device can be the ones on wheels, can be a stark wall system, can be whatever. And you have to have a process for cleaning those when they're gonna be used. Um, regardless of where they're gonna be used, you don't want that to be the vector of your dust and dirt from, from the last uh, project to now what you're doing today. So it's really important to make sure that you have a process for getting those routinely assessed and wiped down or vacuumed or whatever so that wherever you are you don't have dust. And then dedicating them to ORs is a personal decision and it, it has to do with how much storage space you have, um, how much work you're going to be doing. You know, if you know that you're going to be doing a lot of work in your operating rooms uh, in the next few years and you want to buy some portable device, you know, containment device to service those jobs and you have a place to store them in the OR, that's great. They still can become dusty and dirty um, within the work that's being done in an OR. So there's there's nothing magic about having the dedicated ones um, as long as everything is getting really cleaned as it should be in between uh, projects. So you have to see how much you trust your folks to be on the ball with that and, and complying with the cleaning protocols and figure out how many of these you need and where you're going to store them. All of that will figure into a decision. But there's not a requirement that you have separate uh, in instruments or, or containment devices for ORs. Um, and how do you get them down without creating dust? I think that this just depends on what kind of a containment system that you have. So, you know, you could have plastic sheeting 
and uh, take that down and there's no dust per se involved with that except the dust that sticks onto the plastic and has to be cleaned off um, to you know take it down. Uh, if you have, it's not portable, but uh, sheetrock, then you're talking about a lot more dust. So that's, that's a bigger problem to take down without creating dust. <clears throat> if you have something like the Stark walls, they're meant to just snap together almost like Legos. Um, and there's not dust inherent in that if you wipe everything down um, and clean on both sides of it and you know vacuum up with a HEPA vac, there shouldn't be too much residual dust. You'd have to go and take a look again and make sure that exactly where the wall was meeting the floor or the wall, the containment area was meeting the the walls of your existing place that there's not any micro bits of uh, dust and dirt still left there. Leon, uh, Concord proposed a question in regards to an infection preventionist who is new and new to ICRA. What are the top three things of concern? Thank you, Jen. Uh, number one, develop a relationship and mutual respect with your contractors. Yeah. So a lack of working relationship and or a lack of mutual respect between infection prevention and the contractor can be disastrous. Um, it will cause a lot of friction. There will be there will be issues. Um, so it's very important to develop that relationship and develop that respect because it's very important that the contractor takes the infection preventionist serious seriously and does what the infection preventionist asks. Um, number two, ensuring contractors understand the why more so than the how. Most of you have probably heard this before, that the why is more important than the how. The how is obviously how to set up containment, you know, how to put the stark walls up or how to put the drywall up, how to put the plastic up, how to, how to, how to, how to install a door and sticky mats. Yes, that's all the how. But the why is the more important factor and, that, and ensuring the contractors understand the why is extremely important and that is that is a that is a concern um it, it, it should be a concern and a concern of mine that a contractor may not understand the why uh, for instance a contractor you may um, dictate that a project needs to be an extra class four or an extra class five uh, because you're asking for an anthrum and a contractor may think well we're at the end of this corridor by an elevator it's not a patient care area we're not in any kind of ICU, why do I need an anteroom? It's important to make sure the contractor understands why it needs an anteroom. And the reason may be because patients are being transported right past the entrance of that construction site to go to the elevator. Something as simple as that, a contractor may not see that or may not understand that, but the infection preventionist eyes see things differently. They see the patients being uh, uh, wheeled past the entrance of a construction site which could be an indirect, uh, indirect um, uh, way for, for an infection. Um, number three, it's essential that a new IP learns and understands how to use ASHI's ICRA 2.0. Uh, learn the ins and outs of ASHI's ICRA, ICRA 2.0 with the patient risk groups and the work activity, how to marry those together to find the proper ICRA class, um, how to complete the ICRA permit, and how to make sure that the contractor is doing what they should be doing. Um, and I, I would think that a number, uh, a, a last thing of concern for a new IP um, and it's someone new to ICRA as well uh, would be the lack of experience. I remember when I started doing construction um, infection prevention years ago, years and years ago, I really didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what I was looking for. I was just kind of walking through construction sites, you know, kind of, kind of dumbfounded. And because I didn't have the experience, but years went on and I was, you know, in and out of construction sites constantly and talking to contractors, talking to project managers, attending the meetings, learning all the acronyms and the abbreviations, and just really getting a better understanding of how construction works and how it works in the inside the construction sites and getting a, a better understanding and a, and a better, better visual of what the actual risks are. And that just comes with experience. And uh, those are probably my probably my top four uh, things of concern. You know, can I add something? I, I, yes. I want to give a shout out to the um, Carpenters Union that has done a lot of work in educating infection preventionists about construction and safe uh, construction. And they didn't have to do that. They just really took that on 
And yep. uh, if, if the people who ask that are um, APIC members, they should see about how, how to reach out to the uh, Carpenters Union about getting that training. They offer some pretty good programs for free to infection prevention and control folks. Yes, yeah, the training is excellent. Great. Janet, if there is an infection control breach, does the IP have the authority to stop construction until the breach is corrected? You know, we're all powerful, right? <laughs> uh, or so we think. So this again, like I, I feel, um, I'm gonna piggyback on the last question about the new IPs or IPs new to construction and say, I'm gonna answer this again, that it depends what's in your facility's policy and what the authority statement is for the infection prevention and control uh, people in regards to, to construction. So if you're new to construction, take a look at what existing policies and procedures you have for your facility or your health system and see um, if it makes sense to you. And, uh, and if you think that you need that authority, um, you know, seek to get it into that policy. So there's nothing magic that says, infection preventionists everywhere always have the authority to stop construction in its tracks. Um, but it's a good thing when we do have that authority and when we use it wisely, right? You, you know, usually there is a way to not get to that point to be able to maybe stop things for an hour while some protection is fixed um, or um, some breach is really taken care of. Um, but there's nothing automatic that says that infection preventionists always have the authority to do that. So it's really important to know what's in your policy and procedure and advocate to get that in there. Great. We've had a number of great questions that have actually been coming in during this live session. So I'm going to jump in and add some of those and throw them your way if you guys are ready for it. Um, so a, a, question from, <laughs> a question from Jonathan. Why is venting into the exhaust system considered a bad option? I can try to answer that. Uh, I have been told by uh, many facilities personnel that dumping your negative air into exhaust um, and, and return, return is a definitely a no-no. Some situations you can do it in the exhaust. Facilities personnel and directors have told me that that, that affects pressures. That affects your static pressure inside your, 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 your duct system, inside your AHU inside that whole HVAC system. And that can cause problems. Um, and it can also cause a problem if that exhaust happens to be connected to something else. Uh, with older buildings, things get changed, maybe a drawing gets lost, not updated. That exhaust could be connected to something else. And then you're dumping negative air into there from your HEPA machine, which you're assuming is HEPA. What if it's not? And if you're dumping that air into there, and for some reason something got tied into that exhaust and it's being supplied to a different area, you've got a big problem. So I have seen instances, and I've been asked that question many times, can we dump into the, dump into the exhaust, into an exhaust? And um, it, re it, it really relies on a thorough investigation of that exhaust duct system, making sure, 100% sure that that is an actual exhaust going out of the building and making sure nothing else is tied into that. In, in the instances, in the situations where you don't have other options for negative air, the exhaust can be used if you're 100% sure that that is going out of the building and the facility signs off on that. Great. A question from Angie. When you have a construction site with barriers up to the ceiling, at what point should you extend the barriers up to the deck? Up to the, uh, so we have barriers up to the drop ceiling is what I'm assuming this question's asked. And yeah. then and above the drop ceiling. Should you ex yeah, yeah, and then at what point should you extend the barrier up to the deck? Uh, great question. Um, pretty much every situ every construction project where the ceiling comes out. So inside the construction area, inside the construction project, if that ceiling is coming out, the grid, the all the ceiling tile, if that's all coming out and there's going to be demolition in that construction space, then you should be sealing up to the deck. Um, and that keeps that keeps the entire area, that keeps the entire construction site contained as a whole. Um, so that's that's when it's uh, necessary to to complete that. Um, complete that containment all the way up to the deck. Which is really hard to do because it's not like it's just empty space. There's all kinds of stuff up above it there. It never is. Yeah. So if you can, it, depending what's going on, if you can do some of that dust creating work before you mm -hmm. have to take out the drop ceiling, 
yeah. you can do yourself maybe a little favor and not not have to worry about going all the way to the deck but um but i agree with leon if you're if you don't have a choice but to do it that way then then it's a lot of work and that's often done with with plastic just because uh it can get around conduit pipes and all that stuff yeah yep a question from eve just came in i'm a new ip and unfamiliar with airflow ducts returns exhausts and exactly what should be sealed off construction crew members are poking holes in air supply seals to allow air conditioning into the space is that okay as long as negative airflow is maintained yes that is okay because um Technically, you should have your supply diffusers and your return diffusers all sealed up so they're not getting contaminated. Obviously, if you have a supply ductwork that is on, so it's supplying air, constantly supplying air, you can't get dust into that supply. And sometimes construction spaces, if they're not um, temperature regulated, it's going to get hot in there. So you do need some air. I have seen before and I have approved um, supply diffusers being covered up, but open a little bit to get some air in there that is that is acceptable to do as long as you don't have a lot of supply air because the if you have a lot of supply air coming in your construction site that's going to negatively affect your negative yeah. pressure so that'll cause your negative pressure to be less negative possibly even neutral to positive depending on how much supply air you have coming into that construction site so you just need to be uh, mindful of how much uh, supply air you're allowing in yeah i'm a little bit concerned that she's saying that they're poking holes mm -hmm. into their ductwork so if there's something that they're modifying ductwork then uh as opposed to just opening up your supply uh, registers um then that that has to be done in in uh coordination with the facilities people for all the reasons that we talked about making changes to the hvac that are more permanent um can have implications for other areas of your hospital mm -hmm. What type of particulate monitor are you using? Um, I currently use the TSI, uh, I think it's TSI Dust Track, I think 9303. Um, that's the one I've had the best, uh, the best experience with and the best, um, I've, it's been, been easy to use, very user friendly, and um, it, it, it's, it's an excellent instrument. Great, and for you again, Leon, um, do you have a form that you use when the areas are assessed daily? Yes, we do. Yes, I have a I have a form uh, that we use with the Allegheny Health Network. A question from Jennifer: How do you verify the HEPA filtration? Jen, do you want to go back to that slide? Yeah, let's do it. I think we're there, right? Let's see. Yes, we are there. So. This picture is a very basic picture, but this shows how to verify your HEPA filtration. Um, and verifying your HEPA filtration is what you need to do is you need to compare the number of particles that your HEPA machine is pulling in. You compare that to the number of particles that it is exhausting out. That difference is your percent reduction. Um, so the picture on the left is a particle counter resting on top of the HEPA machine. That is the intake filter. So that particle counter on the left is pulling in the particles, not pulling in the particles, it's counting the particles that the HEPA machine is pulling in. I mean, I could stand there and hold it, but why stand there and hold it? I can just set it on top of the HEPA machine. So you get a particle count there. In most construction spaces, it's you know, 500,000, 2 million particles um, at, at, at reading at a 0.3 micron level. Then the picture on the right, that is the particle count, um, using a particle counter, testing the exhaust air. So that's the clean air, that's downstream of the HEPA filter outside the construction site. That number is always gonna be much, much less than the number you're getting on the left, because that's your uh, particle count of the exhaust. That's, that, that's your HEPA filtered air. So to, to determine your percent reduction, you take your particle count number at the intake, you subtract the particle count at the exhaust, you, multi, you divide that by the particle count at the intake times 100. Easy to remember is large number minus your small number divided by your large number times 100. That gives you your percent reduction. Um, and that's how you verify that your HEPA filtration is 99.97. HEPA filtration is uh, rated to remove particles at a 99.97% reduction down to 0.3 microns. That's how they're rated. So that's how you um, verify your HEPA filtration. Great. And 
let's see, maybe we have time for, for one more. Um, question from Doug, how do you get a negative if you can't exhaust outside? There are, there's not, I was almost said there's always a way, pretty much always a way. Um, yes, there's a lot of construction spaces where you don't have a window or maybe you can't open a window. Um, I have seen many instances like this where a contractor has gotten uh, very smart about it and they've, they've built something, they've, they've developed something. Um, there are other ways to get negative pressure, even if you don't have a window or you can't go outside. Um, if you have containment at the front of the construction site, uh, your, your, your entrance to the, to the construction site or an anteroom, you can dump negative air through there and then out the corridor. Um, or you can take your negative air and um, take your, your, your flexible exhaust duct up okay. over a ceiling and into the next corridor and you connect that to a new diffuser in the ceiling and therefore uh, developing, developing negative pressure. Great. One last question. Um, Karen asks, what other instruments do you recommend IPs uh, purchase for their ICRA work? This is open to both of you. So I don't question. know that I don't know that IPs need to do that. Sorry, Leon. Um, so I think that that this is where your multidisciplinary team often comes into play. Like, so Leon is an infection preventionist that does all construction, and wouldn't we all love to have a Leon in our lives, right? But if you're an infection preventionist who's in charge of um, construction and you know. NHS and surveillance and, and all these other things, you know, COVID reporting, et cetera, you may not be the right person to do this. So just because it says it has to be done, it doesn't mean it has to be done by you and that you have to take ownership of this equipment and own it and maintain it and calibrate it and all that stuff. So I would recommend that you partner with your facilities folks um, and, uh, and see who's going to do this. If there may be a safety person that's a better person to do this, and then how those results will be communicated so that you're aware of it. And I would I would recommend getting an in-service on how these things are used so that you can speak to it. And if you had to do it, you could do it in a pinch. But um, you know, because nobody wants to be sort of um, told something and not really understand how it works. But uh, but I think that we have to. Think about whether we are the ones who have to own the whole process versus share the process uh, among the team. And then I'll leave it to Leon to say what exact equipment that the team should have. Excellent, thank you, Janet. And um, yes, so the instruments that I commonly use are particle counter, obviously. Uh, I've been using one for years, so I'm, to be honest, I'm, I'm thrilled that ASHI um, now is requiring HEPA filtration uh, verification for your for your for your higher higher risk projects because that's something I've been doing for years because most IPs most project managers most contractors just assume that the HEPA machine is doing what HEPA should do and you don't know that without a particle counter um, so I, I I I commonly use and carry with me a particle counter a differential manometer um, and the last thing is a moisture meter um, but again. It, 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 it can really, really be determined who is going to be responsible for those types of things. Particle counting, I really think, should be uh, infection prevention, in my opinion. Differential manometer, which can be used to test pressure relationships between different corridors, different areas, and a moisture meter. That's something can, that, that can be uh, used by, you know, maybe like a safety specialist or, or a facilities manager. Great. I'm passionate a lot of this there, is, sorry. <laughs> no, I love it. Um, a lot of questions have come in about, will a, the recording be available? Will the slides be available? What next? Are we gonna present the whole ICRA? Um, and yes, mark your calendars. On November 17th, uh, Stark will be participating in an Ashley Lunch and Learn. Janet and Leon uh, will share an updated ICRA 2.0 presentation that will be included with the latest updates from Ashi as well as what they're seeing in the field. You don't want to miss it. November 17th. You can keep an eye out for an invitation from Stark. Um, and on that note, we want to thank everyone so much for submitting so many great questions. Yeah, thank you. Another huge thank you to our speakers, Dr. Janet Haas and Leon Young. Um, to access the ICRA 2.0 form and permit from ASHI, please visit the web address listed here.
Um, I also want to remind you that Stark Systems designs and manufactures fully ICRA compliant temporary containment systems that eliminate the disruption of renovation. You can learn more at starksystems.com. A recording from today's session will be available soon. Thank you again so much for joining us. We appreciate you being here and we hope you all have a wonderful day. Great questions. Thank you, everybody. Thanks.